the, the, the discussion being now is a wonderful time to start an independent label. We have some entrepreneurs out there. Is anybody, uh, you know, specifically label interested? Is anybody thinking that they are their own label or that are they interested in starting their own label? We have quite a few people here. Yeah. We had a discussion leading in in that, you know, today pretty much every creator is their own label. Well, I think that's right. And, you know, I, I certainly started out that way. I mean, I, I was, a, as I said, I was a musician. I was a studio musician, actually, originally. And then I became an artist. And um, as an artist, I started my band started our own label, and that's actually, we wound up getting signed to major labels. I've actually had six major label deals, believe it or not, uh, in my career. So if you want to know anything about major labels, I am the expert. Um, and, um, or independent labels, too. Or independent <laughs> labels, too, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I've owned several labels as well. But um, yeah, my contention is there's no such thing as DIY. I think that the minute you put out a recording, and I'm not, I'm not talking about on a CD or a vinyl, I'm just saying the minute you uh, produce a track and upload it to something, SoundCloud or Spotify or anywhere, put it on TuneCore, uh, via TuneCore or any other service, CD Baby, um, you are actually now performing some of the functions of a label. I say some of the functions because there are a lot of functions that a label performs. And, um, you know, the other thing that concerns me about the DIY title is that it sort of implies that you can do everything yourself. And frankly, it's pretty difficult to do everything yourself. So. What my contention is that you need a team. Now, you can hire that team. You can get a bunch of friends to be that team and just do it on a sort of a, you know, uh, collective basis. Um, or you can sign with an independent label. You can sign with a major label. You can go with a uh, label services organization that can put a team behind you. Uh, management services. We have management services organizations. We have artist services organizations. But somewhere along the way, you're going to need more than yourself if you want to go all the way with your music. What I think is exciting today is you can go all the way. And we all know the examples of people that have um, uh, recently, like Chance the Rapper and so on. Um, it's not easy to do that, by the way. There's a lot of noise out there. You know, I was at Spotify the other week, and they were telling me they get 500,000 uploads per month. And put that in perspective, that's 50,000 album equivalents in a month. And in 1968, there were 6,000 albums came out. So, you know, it's just an awful lot of noise out there. And, you, and, and so your objective, whether it's as an artist recording something and putting it up, or whether you, you, you formally decide that you want to be a label or whatever, is putting together some kind of organization, some kind of package that will allow you to rise above the noise of those other 499,000 tracks that get uploaded that month. And for an artist, you know, um, uh, finding that right independent label, um, uh, part of our discussion too was about a label's role in the curation process. Uh, so much of music um, is consumed today and is potentially fed to us by AI, even in playlisting. Absolutely. Um, and data that has been called, you know, from us in our habits um, and is, is not cur curated necessarily from a human perspective. Right. Um, would you? say that independent labels today are doing a, re a great job or their role still primarily is, is to curate uh, themselves? Um, uh, and is the roster approach to curation um, um, something that most independent labels you know, are doing today? Yeah, I mean, so I think all labels, major and independent, curate. Um, there's just a slightly different methodology between the majors and the independents, and I can talk about that. Um, I think in general the independents curate, uh, they brand, they tend to brand um, by label more. It's not universally true. There are independent labels that do all kinds of music. But you take a label like, say, Warp, that specializes in electronic music. You take a label like Hopeless, specializes in pop punk. Sub pop. Sub pop. Sure. Stone throw, hip hop, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, you know. The, you can find that, and I, for 14 years I worked for Smithsonian Folkways Recordings. I ran the business uh, of their label, and Smithsonian Folkways is not genre specific by any means. A lot of Americana, but there's also 50% world music, a lot of children's music. But they still are branded uh, as a label because there's a certain methodology they use. Their notes always take a certain form. The recordings are always a certain kind of you know, type of recording and so on, so people would often by every recording we put out, um, just because they like the way we approach things. So uh, I think that uh, 
you know, the thing I would say, nobody ever walks into a store, even if you can find a store to walk into these days, and says, actually, you have a good one in Boston. You have Newbury Comics, don't you? But, um, you know, if you can find a store to walk into these days, nobody walks in and says, I want a Sony record. What's the latest Sony record? Or what's the latest Universal record? But they might do that with Warp Records or Hopeless or one of these other you know, sub pop. It was definitely true in the, in, the, mm -hmm. in, the, in the grunge days in the early 90s. Um, people were devouring everything they put out because they obviously had their finger on the pulse. So yeah, I think that's a really important aspect of what independents do. Um, I think curation in general is an important aspect of what labels do. They choose things that they think are going to succeed and then they put their resources behind it, whether it be a uh, genre-branded label or whether it be the kind of marketing and promotion that they can bring to bear to that type of record. Yeah. What, uh, um, I mean, it's a wonderful time to start an independent label. How yeah. do I start an independent label? <laughs> what are my steps? Well, I mean, it really depends on where you're starting from. You know, I look at our, our, our roster of independent labels, and there's, we have a significant number of independent labels that are substantial independent labels that started, um, that have many, many uh, uh, titles in their catalog and uh, many artists in their catalog. And they started as an artist, uh, artist-owned label that, what you might think of as DIY, where they just needed to put out some music. So they put out some stuff on their own label. Then a friend said, can you put something out? So we've got Merge Records started like that, Compass Records started like that, Epitaph started like that. You know, there are, there are many, many labels we have that started that way. So, you know, that, that's one way. If you're an artist, you put something out. The other way is, you know, people who just you know, sort of have natural A and R abilities. They have a friend they like. They love to go to shows. They find artists um, and sign them and put them out. And then you just have the sort of the entrepreneurial approach. People who just want to make money. You know, they they see an opportunity here and they they start the label. So I think it depends on your starting position. But basically, you just have to put something out and start working it. And um, the fact of the matter is, it, it comes down to all the things that you've been hearing about today on the stage, which, are, you know, I would endorse everything that's been said that I've heard so far, and that is, is that it's about awareness and engagement, basically. You've just got to create awareness, and you've got to create an engagement with your fans, however you do that. And that's been true since the day I started in the business, and it's still true today. It's just the methodologies are different today than they were in 1964. Food is still food. The food ingredients still might food. change. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, those four things, um, awareness, acquisition, yep. engagement, and then finally leading down that funnel to monetization. That's right. Um, we know that you know, most labels are monetizing, exploiting their assets, whatever they own, monetizing via the recorded music. Are you seeing any new or emerging interesting ways that independent labels in particular have uh, uh, found some ancillary revenue streams um, to be able to support or grow their brand, grow their grow their um, uh, label? Well, I think Pledge has done a huge amount. You know, the $55 per um, uh, uh, release or per, per, um, per, per transaction, transaction yeah. Yeah. Is, is an amazing number. Um, you know, compare that to, you know, well, what you get from streaming, which is a fraction of a penny, um, or depending on how it's streamed, but certainly a small number. Um, you know, that's, that's an incredible thing. So, you know, certainly as a label, there's nothing, there's, I think the, the, the field is wide open today as to how you structure a label and how you, you know, whether it's part of a management company, whether you have merch part of it, you know, touring and so on and so forth. I think, you know, any way you can create this awareness and any way you can acquire fans and any way you can monetize is, is perfectly legitimate. What I do take exception to, and I think the battle that we've faced over the past um, 18 years is the idea that recorded music should just be free. I mean, there used to be five pillars to the music industry. There was, and I hope I don't forget them now, but there was recordings, publishing, merchandise, endorsements, and uh, touring. And, um, you know, what we did in 2000 was we basically dumped the recording side and said, you know, there were people like Chris Anderson out there with his book free saying, oh, we just go out and tour and make money. Well, it's fine, but the recording's actually worth something. In fact, recordings cost quite a lot of money to make. Even today, when you can, you know, buy Ableton cheaply or Cubase or Pro Tools or you can download a free version of uh, Fruity Loops or whatever, 
you still got to spend a fair amount of time making those recordings, and if you know, time always has value. So there is a cost to making that recording, and somebody's making money from it. And my my contention, uh, uh, speaking as a, an artist and a musician now, is that if somebody's making money from it, I should be making money from it. And um, and the fact of the matter is, people are making money from it. Radio is making money from the music they play. They test your music against the audience. If your music doesn't test against that audience, they don't play it because the music has to work for the advertisers who pay the $11.5 billion to the music stations to play your music. So it's egregious that they don't pay this money out. And you could go on and on. Same thing with YouTube. YouTube's making money off of your music, even if they're not paying you. So we need to solve this problem. Music needs to not be perceived as being free, whether it's recorded or otherwise. Absolutely.